2012 to 2015 school committee meeting and as we got to continue our budget presentation uh, we'll be talking about the regular day and the special education cost centers this evening uh, first as we always do is there public input that isn't on the agenda welcome sure I've, typically we ask you to st come up if you want to if you don't feel comfortable you're fine and and welcome my name is Andrea Korbach, and I'm a budget parent for the Wood End School. And I've um, been to a few of the meetings um, prior to the, the formal um, presentations of the budget, as well as I was a budget parent last year. <coughs> so um, I just wanted to make a comment about the, um, the regular day and how we spoke last week about the um, $849,000 or so of proposed cuts. and. Um, my biggest concern, and I've heard from a lot of other people, is around the um, paraeducators. And I know there was a lot of comments last week, more so towards the, ac um, the ac athletics uh, tuition. And I just wanted to add the importance of the paraeducators to the concern of that list. Um, from my own personal experience at Wood End, um, I also have kids in the extended <coughs> day and the before school, so I know that that might go up. And you know, and that's I feel as though that's something I choose to do. So I feel like that is something that <coughs> it's a parent's choice, and I know that that's on the list as well. Um, but the para educators um, run that in the wood end, at least in the before school, and they're wonderful. Um, I also know from my own child's experience that she frequently para educators are used in the classroom with if a teacher has to go to a meeting outside um, of the class and that they're also used you know, very heavily just throughout the day, whether it's lunch, recess, and they just seem to me, even though I'm not in the school all day long, really the glue that holds the school together, especially in an elementary school. Um, so I just really wanted to advocate on their behalf around seeing them in the line um, budget. And also, um, just to add a couple other things, uh, my daughter's in kindergarten this year, and her teacher had um, a major medical accident and had to have her teacher replaced weeks before school started and one of the paraeducators that was um, assigned to another classroom got assigned to her classroom and I, I strongly believe that um, the success of the class has been due to this paraeducator who has a lot of experience in kindergarten and the teacher that came in um, I think was a specialist in the school so it was sort of like a new role for her to be a kindergarten classroom teacher and it's worked really well and I feel like you know, the paraeducator had a huge role um, to play in that um, and then I also just know from speaking from one of them personally last week around the budget um, she pointed out an example where two of the paraeducators during one lunch had to cover meetings um, in other classrooms. And so her and another paraeducator who had called out sick, so there was like a replacement, they were the only two covering lunch. And she said, you know, it was crazy, even though there was two of us, but I felt like I was the only one who really had the school experience to know what was going on. So again, it just proves how their role is vital um, in the school day and just how everything flows um, for the children to be effective. So. I just wanted to highlight that as a concern. Thank you very much for your comments. I, I might add that last week was really just the overview. And, yeah. and we had not planned at all to talk about any of the items really in detail until this evening. So we got sidetracked on that athletic conversation last mm -hmm. week. I hope you don't think that that means that we were valuing that more than Paris. Mm -hmm. That was just our overview. So we'll get more into it tonight. But your Sounds comments good. are excellent. Thank you. Oh, thanks. <coughs> Other, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Other public input that isn't on the agenda this evening? Great. Uh, I'll, I'll ask for reports from the school committee. Are there reports this evening from the school committee? Dr. Doxer. So I said at the last meeting that I would update, do a more, more thorough update on the Martin Luther King Day event. It's this coming Monday at 9.30 in the morning. There'll be a light breakfast at 10. There'll be the presentation. Um, we want to thank Eastern Bank as well as Reading Cultural Council and Moynihan Lumber for the funding they provided that have ena has enabled this program to happen. I'm reporting on it because I am the school committee me member that is the liaison to the Human Relations Advisory Committee, but I'm also a member of the Human Relations Advisory Committee. The event has actually expanded, so when you enter at 930, there will be exhibit tables because the theme of this event is we stand together for justice and so we thought how powerful it would be to actually have 
examples of how students and community groups are standing up for justice and to help other people. So at this point, we have about between 10 and 15 tables of groups that are going to be answering questions and telling people about what they do to make a difference, to stand up. Um, and AWAD, the World of Difference program, is going to be doing an activity, which I just received some examples, and I cannot resist. May I um, just have a little bit of license? Absolutely. So. Um, Many of the schools, the World of Difference program has distributed these activity sheets to many of the schools, and um, the, as well as at Zynga to adults and students. Uh, and the goal is to have people write about times when someone stood up for them or when they stood up for someone else. And I don't know um, if you can see this, but this is a picture of that a child drew about um, when my sister hit me and it wasn't fair, my mom came over and stood up for me. Um, and these, I guess I can't read them, but um, they're all quite poignant, the ones that I've already skimmed. Um, they're specific and they're getting the point that sometimes the choice is hard, but we have to make a hard choice to stand up for other people. So um, these are online on the Martin Luther King Day Facebook page, you can download them, you can fill them out before you get there, or the AWOD peer leaders will be there um, having people fill them out, and they will be displayed all along the wall as an example of a sim symbol of how we stand together for justice. Um, in addition, the donors have made it possible to purchase four portraits from, um, from just Rob Surratt, sorry, just right out of my brain. Rob Surratt, who um, is a world-renowned portrait artist, speed painter, and he is going to not speed paint these portraits, which will be on our Library Media Center walls at the high school, and he is going to paint Martin Luther King, Harvey Milk, Leonard Zakem, and Malala. The GSA has been really instrumental in figuring out who the fourth um, role model would be, and the students chose Malala. And the GSA has also been researching quotes, and they are, right now, they have put out some choices for each of these role models of quotes, and the student body is voting on which quotes they would like to be painted into the portraits. So, there will be a catalyst for discussion ongoing so that the message, this isn't a hit and run lesson, this is something that will continue over time and that's the goal. Um, we have community groups that will be singing, we have GSA and AWOD members that will be speaking and we have a very first time Metco Elementary School chorus that will be singing as well. So um, we hope people can come, it's free <coughs> and it starts at 9.30 on Monday, Martin Luther King Day, January 19th. Thank you. Thank you, that was wonderful. Other reports? Mr. Robinson. Just, <clears throat> just very briefly, uh, and I only report on this uh, because we had a staff member at the Reading uh, Pop Warner end of year banquet was Saturday, and John Fiore, uh, I think for the first time, came and, and spoke to the, to the to the players and the cheerleaders, and, and one of John's great strengths is his uh, uh, his talks he gives on teamwork and and how everyone matters, and it takes takes that. And he he did that for the team, and it, he did a very nice job. He took the time out on a Saturday from his family and came there, and hopefully will make that a annual event. So shout out to John for doing that. Administrative reports this evening. Dr. Doherty? Great. Let's get started. Okay. So tonight, Dr. Doherty? All four of us at some point are going to be presenting. <coughs> because we are, I'm going to, I'm going to kind of stand with you. <laughs> <laughs> so everyone can see. You know, and I'll sort of this way. Um, so tonight we're going to do two cost centers, the two largest cost centers of our budget the regular day cost center and the special education cost center. So um, the way it'll work is I'll, I'll do an introduction 
to each of the cost centers. Um, I will turn it over um, to <coughs> someone else at McKinney McMartha will be doing a lot of the, the financial piece of it. Carolyn will speak to um, uh, some of the more specifics of the special education programs and some of the restructuring effort. Craig is going to speak to some of the, um, the, uh, the pieces of the, uh, the regular day budget, uh, most notably the uh, instructional code piece. So this is the second meeting of our, uh, of our presentations. On Thursday night, we will complete our presentations. And then um, from that point forward, really will be the majority of the discussion from the committee. Um, Martha has been working on the questions you've been sending us. If you have additional questions, please please send them to us so uh, we can get them done. Our goal is to have them all done for the 22nd um, of January so that we can start uh, discussing all of the information with you um, on the 22nd. There is also a public hearing on the 22nd. Um, and that doesn't mean the public can't ask questions in other meetings, but that's legally we have to have a public hearing on the budget. And then right now you are scheduled to take a vote on the 26th. So the regular day cost centers, uh, cost center has um, a few functions. Uh, the first one is the school building leadership, which are all of your administrators, department heads at the high school, school secretaries, and any non-instructional supplies, materials, and equipment. So that's one function. Another uh, function is instructional services. This is the bulk of your regular day budget. Um, this is all of your teachers, your specialists, the regular education paraeducators, not special education paraeducators, substitute teachers, and any curriculum <coughs> leadership positions that are not department heads, such as team leaders, mentors for our, our new teachers, um, and any professional development or curriculum stipends. Um, guidance and counseling is another function, um, and our psychological services is another function. Please note that school psychologists are in regular day. They are not in special education because they service all students, um, and also our regular education social workers, and our school adjustment counselor is in this cost center as well. Uh, also, we have <coughs> instructional materials and equipment. This is really all of the materials. The per pupil funding that we, we are uh, recommending is, is one of the reductions. Uh, it comes out of this function. And then regular day transportation, which is also another area that we are recommending um, for, for reduction is in this function. So one of the things that you're going to see for each of the cost centers is how does it tie into our goals. So I showed you this slide um, on the first night that was not bold-faced. Um, these areas that are bold-faced are the areas that do, in the budget, that connect to, um, uh, I'm sorry, that are in the goals that connect to the regular day uh, cost center. So you can see it involves the implementation of the frameworks, uh, supporting level three improvements at Joshua Eaton and across the district, long-term plan for technology integration, professional learning communities, MTSS, you can see, and so on and so on. Um, so the, the regular day cost center, there is a significant amount of goal-oriented activity happening. So the drivers for the regular day budget um, include our contractual uh, increases, step column, and COLA increases for teachers, regular education, paraprofessionals, and secretaries. Um, there are two offset increases to this budget. Um, one is the MECO grant offset increase. A few years ago, we were at $100,000. Uh, we did decrease that um, to $75,000 um, last year and the year before. Um, we feel that we can um, in, increase that back up to the $100,000 that it originally was for a couple of reasons. One is that the grant has pretty much stayed the same over the last several years, um, although there is a slight reduction with 9C cuts, proposed 9C cuts this year of about $6,000, I believe, um, that will not have a major effect on what we're trying to do in the programs. But the other thing is, is that um, we were finding some things in the past that we're no longer finding when it, um, <coughs> when it, when it comes to some of the, some of the uh, positions that, that come out of the budget. So we have had a surplus uh, towards the end of each fiscal year in this grant. We feel we can um, increase this offset back up to the $100,000. Um, the full day kindergarten Excuse offset. Sorry, John. Mr. Yes. This question, is the town still providing that the uh, 
think it was Sanborn place their bus to take the kids to the train? Uh, if there has been demand, yes. Okay. Yes, we are, and it's, we, we pay for the driver and we pay for the fuel. <laughs> um, and it has been Sanborn sometimes, and sometimes it's been the uh, elderly services. Yeah. It depends. Oh, we're still doing it. We are still doing it based on demand. I don't believe right now there I is a demand. I don't believe we have one for the winter. We did for the fall because there were a couple mm -hmm. uh, of our Metro students who participated in after school sports. So we did run one for the fall sports season. I don't believe we have one right now for the winter season. We do have a late bus for our middle school students that we did not have a couple of years ago. We do now have that. So there is a second bus a couple days a week. Mm -hmm. um, Full day kindergarten, we are increasing this offset by $50,000. I am going to speak, or Martha's going to speak a little bit later about a potential impact to this uh, offset if we do not have the modular classrooms. It will have, an, it will have a, uh, a double hit to our budget. Um, so, so she'll talk more about that uh, in a little bit. And then reductions to the regular day budget that are being proposed as part of the $850,000 reduction include regular day bus transportation, which Martha will go into in some detail later, substitute teachers, the per pupil building budget, which is $26,000 in the reduction, um, and then there's another amount for restructuring that we'll talk about in a minute. The stipends um, for the virtual high school, which does not eliminate virtual high school, um, it changes the model that we're using to a single subscription program instead of uh, a, a number of slots that we currently have. Um, and then the reduction to the regular education paraeducators that um, one of our budget parents had spoken about at the beginning. So I'm going to turn it over to Martha now, and she's going to go into the, the numbers in a, in a little bit more detail. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so this first slide that I wanted to um, discuss with you all is uh, our regular day staffing. So. Um, <coughs> Um, as you can see, our, our total FTE count has stayed somewhat consistent over the last few years. I know um, in the first night when we were talking about the administrator, administration cost center, one of the things that the new HR administrator and I do want to look into doing is um, implementing position control, which will allow us to use MUNIS to identify where open positions are, where we've added positions much more easily. Right now we're trying to track this. This is a massive spreadsheet with many, many columns and over 800 lines. So it's it's time consuming to track it this way. And um, as I'll point out in special ed, there's human error that happens when we do it this way. So, um, but right now. Um, so, so is that a component of units that we're not using? Yet? It is, yes. Why is that? Um, you know, it takes a lot of time to set it up. And I think we just haven't had the bandwidth to, to take the time to really set it up. I know we can have someone come out from Tyler Technologies and help us with it. And that's one of our, it's on the list for Michelle Saunders and I for a winter project. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, as you can see in the teacher line, you can see we're going from 110 to 111. That's for the grade one teacher. I'll point out a couple of other things. You can see the instructional coaches is here at 2.0. Um, uh, paraprofessionals, you can see the reduction in FTE. That's uh, we equated the hours that we needed to reduce to achieve the 135,000. We convert that into MTE so that we could show it to you this way as well. And then um, this one is worth mentioning only because uh, Dr. Dory pointed this out as well. Um, <coughs> the psychologists are in the regular day budget, but this reduction that we're talking about, this not reduction, this um, restructuring that we're talking about for the TSP and the SSP is coming out of the regular day budget. So I want to point that out too. Uh, again, here is our regular day by uh, by cost center, um, or by object, uh, professional salaries. Um, in the other salaries line, I'm gonna uh, well, we'll start with professional salaries. So that that's a function of your increases, your colas, things along that nature. Your clerical salaries. One of the reasons you're seeing that jump up a little bit more than the two and a half percent that the secretary's bargaining unit had is we changed the the number of hours that they worked from 35 to 37 and a half. So they now work a, a seven and a half hour day versus a seven hour day. So that's in the first year impact of that 
change to their schedule. Um, the significant decrease that you're seeing in other salaries, that's a function of the substitute reduction and the pay reduction. So that's both things that are going on in that one budget line. Um, so the paraprofessionals, there's, there's diff obviously there's, there's you know special education paraprofessionals, and I want to touch on those. But so there's paraprofessionals that do you know regular um, routines like like um, budget parent had mentioned, um, meeting students before school, um, being with them after school, monitoring the. You do? Yeah. Okay, all right. Sorry, right, thanks. <laughs> that's all right. I didn't want to cut you off. No, no, I thanks. If you do, that's up. great. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Cool, no problem. Um, contracted okay. services, that is, uh, that's our, a function of our bus reduction, which I have a slide we'll talk about that coming up. Um, supplies and material, that, a uh, couple things to point out here. The last time we had to take a per pupil reduction was back in FY12, which we ended up actually spending $557,000. You see the huge bump in FY13, that's our purchase <coughs> math, math and focus curriculum. If you look at what we're proposing for FY16, it's 581,000, so it's still above what we would cut back in FY12, but um, certainly we, it's a one-time, one-year cut to this, uh, to this expenditure for our building principles. And then for other expenses, this is our restructuring of our PD funds. Um, so that's just you know, another nice way to look at in terms of percentages, what we spend our money on um, in the regular day cost center. Obviously, the bulk of it is our instructional services, which covers our teachers and anything else that's used for uh, classroom type of uh, mm -hmm. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I'm just kind of looking at okay. like <laughs> Surveying the landscape. Yep. Okay. Um, so on this one, again, you can see, um, well, let's start up here with the um, the teachers, department heads, leadership, instructional teachers. Okay, so some of uh, it, and it's not significant in this one. It will be in special education. We take our revenue offsets to our teacher line. So, um, so the increases in uh, offsets that Dr. Dory spoke about earlier, they're baked into this teaching service line. So, this line would be if we hadn't increased our full day pay and. Um, Mental grant. grant, thank you. If we hadn't increased those two, this line would be increased by that $70,000. That's where those increases are being felt. Um, paraprofessional, this is the one that we've been talking about, the reduction in, uh, in hours. Um, professional development, this is the restructuring that we talked about. Um, the per pupil expenditure for right now, I have um, taken that $76,000 reduction all in this one line just so I knew where it was um, in case there were some uh, things that we wanted to change or if there were some recommendations that the school committee didn't uh, agree with, I would have it all in one place and I would only go to restore it if that's something. I'm sorry, I was looking down when you said this is where. Oh, we two, uh, 243, general supplies. <coughs> Thank you. Um, a, a question that came up earlier um, from one of our budget parents that it's worth um, bringing up now, 272 testing and assessments. So this is in regular day, um, and, and this has gone down. Part of this is I think the high school has eliminated CWRE. CWRE. So that, that's why that's... Like, oh, the old CWRE. What What's that? that? The college <laughs> work writing <laughs> Oh, my bad. <laughs> It's such a benefit to have them. <laughs> so that that's why this has gone down. We're not um, we're not underfunding this line. We haven't uh, we haven't cut it. So um, so I just wanted to point that was worth mentioning as well. And then um, we will be talking about this again in a future slide. The transportation you can see the school transportation line has has reduced by the proposed um, elimination of the non mandated bus. I have a question about that. The bus so there are still some kids that are mandated to have it. I have a son. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Mrs. Webb. Okay, but I'll say um, that. Yeah, thank you. So I see in figure 79, and we've got the tutors broken out. So where, where is that in this slide? Where the tutors? We're flying out on the tutors and on the tutors. Tutors are, are um, probably in the, probably, they're in the, the paraprofessional 233. Two okay, so they're rolled in on that. Part yeah. That's broken out. Yeah. There. Thank 
Thank you. Sure. If the audience has questions, just grab my attention. All right, so <coughs> regular day transportation. So what I wanted to do is kind of give a, uh, a historical trend <coughs> on where we've been with regular day uh, with busing, both mandated and non-mandated. So we currently run two buses in the district. Um, so they do two runs at the high school, they split and each one covers a middle school, and then they do two runs from Kiln. So our mandated busing, um, based on our figures, has, has grown somewhat from the 25 that it was in 2013, 12-13. Uh, it's been very consistent the last two years, <coughs> both at the elementary school level, so 27 last year, 29 this year. Um, the high school, or not the high school, excuse me, the middle schools has been somewhat consistent as well with a total of 10 in uh, 13, 10 again in 14, a little split between Parker and one at Parker, nine at Coolidge. Um, and then this year, there are currently eight students at Parker that are mandated to transport in sixth grade. Um, and then uh, one mandated at Parker. The next column that you're gonna see is, is our paid ridership. So these are folks that, um, that pay either the $365 or they need the family cap of 650 some combination of both of those. And then the last column is the FRL, which is the free and reduced lunch. So these are these are people who identify themselves as, as qualifying um, under the federal guidelines for free and reduced lunch, and therefore we don't charge them to take the bus. They take the bus for free. Well, it, it, it might be helpful if you kind of covered what mandated. So what um, is the state mandate? The state mandates that we transport uh, any student K through sixth grade that lives in excess of two miles from the school. This is what? So will the um, folks who currently are carrying through lunch still be able to take the mandated, the buses that are carrying the mandated students or not? Um, I, would, uh, I would suggest it, it kill them potentially at the middle school. We're not sure what that's gonna look like because it would be difficult to do one run for both middle schools. So, um, I'm not sure I understand your question. So I jumped ahead, I guess, because she, yeah, I, I'm I jumped ahead because I was assuming if we don't have the, if we only have the buses to support the mandated students and we don't run any of the paid buses. So you, do you want me to answer it? So, but you, you haven't talked about the fee. I know. I'm so no, why don't you talk about the fee? Why don't you talk about the fee? Let her talk about the fee, and then we can see if your question gets answered. Yeah. So, <laughs> so next year we're in the last year of a five-year contract for busing. So next year is year five. So we know what the cost of the bus is going to be for 180 days to transport students. Each bus is going to cost us fifty-two thousand um, dollars. If we assume that our ridership, our paid ridership, <coughs> at 120 is going to stay consistent, although we've seen our paid, paid ridership go from 127, 128, down to 120. We assume that it's going to stay in the 120 range. We would need to charge $435 per student with no cap to achieve the $52,000 to have it be fully funded. Um, we've been recommending 450 to allow for a slight decline. <coughs> so I don't know if that answered your question or not. So we charge no. this year? Right now we charge three sixty five with a six fifty family cap. So then this would be four fifty with no cap. No cap. No cap. If the bus doesn't have enough funding to be self sustaining, we would not have the bus. Okay, so let's if you assume that the buses don't get enough ridership to be self sustaining, what ha what happens to those, let's just say the sixteen elementary students that are on Kilman right now that are currently uh, riding for, did you say free or just reduced? I don't know. Free. free. If, if they're along a route of a bus that already exists, that we have mandated busing, busing. then we can charge a fee for those students to be on the bus. Okay. But we cannot create a new bus. Okay. Okay. And so the free and reduced students along that route would probably still be free then if they're already. If they're, if they're on now, that route and they're, they're on that route. if they're within the two miles. Okay. Correct. If they're outside the two miles, they would have it for free anyway. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. I have you Mr. Robinson? I just want to be, make sure I got, got this clear. So we have to have the buses we be for the mandated and for the free and reduced lunch. For the what? mandated. The free and reduced 
would be in the mandated column if we were required to transport them. If they so don't, they if, live, they if they don't fall outside of two miles. Yeah. Oh, okay. We are not required to. So the, the they are all outside of the two miles. No, correct. Uh, they're within two miles of the school. So. <coughs> so they're counted. Right? The con. So you yeah, said the con. They're outside of two miles. <coughs> they're counted as mandated. Oh, well, okay. okay, that's all right. Go ahead, Mr. Robinson. I was not. That's okay. You, you you said the contract is up this year. Next year, next year, FY sixteen. Well, I, I'm the budget we're going into. Uh, so we don't know what that's going to be yet, or we do. We're mm -hmm. estimating a flat. Is that? No, that that fifty two thousand is the cost of the bus for next year. Next year is the last year of the contract. The FY sixteen is the last year of the contract. So we'll be going out to bid next year for another bus contract. Is okay. there? Uh, of course, you can. Uh, you know the game has changed a little bit in terms of uh, gas prices and so, I mean, is it? Can we go back to the bus company and say, if you want to renew with us next year, be considered for that? We want to break on this year because we of, we can't. No, next year we're we have a contract for next year. I understand that. I'm taught renegotiate it not early. We would have to Base. go out to bid for the whole contract. Yeah. And we not, have to go out to bid for the service. And I don't believe that this bus contract has a fuel escalator charge. No, it doesn't. So we really don't have a position of strength on this one. I'm going to ask a really basic question. I apologize. We have a contract for the, if I want to call it, the coming school year for September Correct. with our existing bus provider for $52,000. Per bus. Per bus. So, okay. Um, we're going to pay $52,200 per bus for next year. Correct. Okay. I, I'm just mm -hmm. stating that. We only need one bus. So we do, uh, the contract doesn't stipulate a number of buses. It right. just simply says, oh, so what we would like to do is reduce that number to one bus to take care of the mandated students that we need to by law mm -hmm. and stop providing the service of allowing parents to pay additional money it, if it's outside or, excuse me, I, I think I wanted to stop talking. <laughs> I was done. We are, done. We are going to still offer it if it is a self-sustaining option. Sure. So I'll use the high school as the best example because there is no mandated transportation right. at the high school. If there are enough riders that will pay the amount of funding for a bus on its own, then the bus will continue. Um, may I ask, uh, okay. there's a student on South Street and there's a student on Franklin. Uh, that's the furthest out I can get on the other side. The bus will go to South Street, and the bus uh, will go. I'll have to ask the bus. You know what I mean? Like, I, I, okay, it, it must also be. There's an established route. Established There's an established route. route. Thank you very much. That's helpful. I'm sorry for the basic questions, no, no, but I got no, a little confused. Right. Mr. Robinson. Uh, so I guess I don't know. If this is too early to, but I mean, th this is something I don't. I think that needs to be discussed further because we, you know, we talked throughout the budget about our most vulnerable students. I mean, I look at, at this, there's a reason why those people need that bus. Uh, and, uh, you know, I guess this is to be continued in, as far as I'm concerned, because I think we need to find a way uh, to try and leave this in the budget. Uh, you know, whether it, uh, I haven't thought of anything yet, but I will by the time we if I could uh, add to that, yeah. if we want to leave it in the budget, it sounds as though we're going to have to increase the rate from 360 yeah. to 450. No, so, I, I. Oh see no, I'm with that. you. So there is a way to keep it in the budget. Yeah. It's just very costly for those parents who choose yeah. to use it, and there's also no cap. Yeah. Just being clear, M Mrs. Webb, you had your hand up. So I, I understand Ms. Robinson's thinking, but I think I would like to um, make sure that we're not making a wrong assumption about who's riding that. I mean, I think. The goal is we want to make sure that all students can get to school, and in this district, other than the mandated, it's the parent's responsibility. So um, we certainly, I, I don't know, I walked two miles plus to this Uphill school both ways in snowstorms. No. Um, so, but that was a different time, different situation. Um, so I, I guess I think I just want to, you know, understand what you're saying. Um, and, you know, maybe it's um, the well, fee has to go up, but we have to 
we we already we already do address the free and reduced lunch thing. So I so I don't know if that means there's also a, a scale or if it's just you just use that as the metric. We that would make sure that we're not leaving people behind that can't maybe don't have other transportation mechanisms. <coughs> other than okay. it sure, just I, I will say yeah. anecd anecdotally that our paid revenue has declined over the last three years from a high of almost 44,000 to only 39,000 this year. And I think it's because the function of the, the paid riders is there are more and more families that are hitting that cap. So I mean, it might be, it might warrant an analysis on, on what the fee is um, to help offset it. Certainly our free and reduced population, um, as we discussed in the first night in the budget overview, has increased. And, um, and they are coming forward, you know, 23 last year, 27 this year. Right. So um, certainly I'll do whatever. Mm -hmm. Mr. Robinson? Plus. Thank you. Yeah, I, mean, I, I think an example, and you can maybe, John, correct me if I'm, I think an example of what someone that may be riding those buses uh, as a choice would be uh, like a Killam student that's living over by the train station, right? Isn't that part of the Killam district? No, that's Eaton. Train station. Part of that this wasn't isn't part of that. The oh, you. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm thinking of the. Oh, they refer to about Ash Street. Street. You're talking about Ash Street. Who it is? Eaton yeah. East yep. in the past. That's Killam. Uh, yeah. Correct. Going to Killam. That's a long way for a kid that's in right. you know fourth or fifth grade, or whatever to walk even. Uh, and I you know I term that as vulnerable, uh, still. So. Uh, I was looking at this a lot of high school kids. That's what I was looking yeah. at. I mean, that, I think that's the main one I th I can think of right now. That that's a long way. That's that's got to be right at the two mile. Um, thank you. I'm just being told that those kids in the area that you're talking about, they're all mandated. Okay. Just the distance. Good. So. It's also interesting. If I might make just an observation, <laughs> is it interesting that? A few weeks ago, you had mentioned that our Chapter 70 calculations when we were talking about full-day kindergarten, and we, we kind of joked, but we used the term that Reading was making too much money, yeah. right? Uh, but yet, our free and reduced lunch students has continually gone up yes. that are taking advantage of this. So uh, it's an observation that that formula is screwed up. Oh, yeah. But other we comments? Agree with that. <laughs> yes. Thank sure. you. So, uh, to Mr. Naya's question, so here's the slide on, on para education and the impact of, uh, of the reduction in, in para hours. So, so the role of the regular ed para education is uh, is before school supervision, uh, lunch and recess supervision, full and half day kindergarten supports, um, office support. They're often they they cover the uh, the building secretary's lunches, um, teacher support. They often do some copying or putting up bulletin boards, assisting with you know, things like that for the teachers, um, small group support. And then they, they do, um, from time to time, substitute for IEP meetings or data meetings. So, so those are the roles, oops, I'm sorry, I need to Those are the roles of the parent educator. So some of the possible impact is, um, is, is less teacher and office support, um, elimination of the before school supervision, um, which might impact parent drop-off time. Uh, reduction of full and half day kindergarten coverage and, uh, and obviously less uh, less small group support. I just want to add one piece of this is not connected to extended day. So there, there we do have before yeah. school programs with extended day. This is not connected to that because parents pay for uh, that program. <coughs> oh, yes. Mrs. So we'll, Webb. We'll oh. discuss. Mrs. Mrs. Webb and then Mr. Knight. Mrs. Webb. So where are the Tutors, I'm sorry, I keep going back to that because I'm Tutors are not students. part of this. This is the regular education para educators. So we're that's talking. a separate line item. Cut. No, we're, 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 what we're talking about are regular education para educators reductions. Not tutors. Not tutors. Okay. Tutors. So, I'm just, so there is a reduction in staffing on the Yeah, that's, that's, an, that's, separate. that's an error. Some oh, of it is they're, uh, they're on grants. Yeah. So they were on the regular day budget and they were on grants. So what we're focused, Thank this you. is regular okay. education para educators and not tutors. Tonight? Stick to this page. So, do any of these uh, paraprofessionals actually come in? I guess I'm confused between tutor paraprofessionals and where the last line is um, less small group student support. 
The difference between tutors and regular education <coughs> paraeducators is that tutors provide instructional support for students in a variety of settings. Regular education paraeducators can do that, but they, it's not necessarily instructional. It could be uh, supervising a group of students using Lexia computer program or something like that. I mean, that's the role of a regular education paraeducator. It is not to provide, I mean, some may, but right, that is right. not their main but, role. But we're not talking about reducing tutors. We are not talking about tutors. I, I we're not reducing tutors. No, we're not reducing tutors. Okay. Dr. Doxa? So am I right that, because I've gotten a little confused when it was combined with paraeducators and tutors. So is it 135,000 taken from the Regular para education paraeducators. Just paraeducators. Correct. Correct. And so when I think about that, I think about, um, my question is, how many full-time <coughs> paraeducators do we have? Are we talking about cutting their hours? Are we talking about cutting out completely some paraeducators? Are we... So we're still um, in the process of trying to figure out what exactly that's going to look like at the elementary level. <coughs> Some of it might be a reduction in hours. We might roll back hours for kindergarten classrooms to 17, 17 hours and 14 hours, depending on whether it's a full day or half day kindergarten class, what type of parent support, regular ed parent support they get. We started those discussions with the district leadership team with the principals last week. We're continuing it this week. So we're still in the process of vetting what that's going to look like. It most likely is going to be a reduction in hours for some and potentially a few positions that are eliminated. And I would assume that in, the, oh, sorry. Go ahead. I would assume in those discussions you'd be talking about how to fill those really important holes that would be left by cutting back. I mean, it was mentioned about lunch, it was mentioned about recess, it was mentioned about the extra student support. So. Um, yeah, this, this cut is not, I mean, none of these reductions are reductions that we want to put forward to the committee. I hope you know, under, everyone understands that. Um, you know, this is, this is probably the most difficult reduction of them all. Right, thank you. Mrs. Borowski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Of the $135,000 cut to paraeducators, some portion of that is the restructuring for the first grade teacher at Eaton. Isn't that correct? That there are paraeducators right now that yeah. were hired to support uh, the larger class sizes. No, it's no. not. So that is that's that that's is out of this they, number. They, um, okay. When I rolled forward the population for next year, okay. um, we we took those three um, positions that were added this year to support those 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 large class sizes. We took those out, and those do fund the grade one teacher. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Robinson. Yeah, I I well, I'd like <laughs> to comment. I'd like to thank uh, the budget parent. I'm sorry um, for your comments earlier I mean I I agree with this uh, back when I was I think I said that John and Chris this morning back when I was on the FinCom the first thing whenever we had lean budget years the first thing we did was cut capital it seems to be a pattern around here whenever we have lean budget years we have to go right to the paraeducators and then we got to try and find these are positions we need and we've got to find ways to put it back in subsequent years. I just think that uh, this isn't something that I don't think I'm going to be able to support at this point. And Mr. Yeah, to just my own past history with, I mean, this has been, as, as Mr. Robinson stated, it's, I've seen this time and time again um, from my time as, a, uh, as an educator in Reading. And um, I agree with Hall highly with what, what he stated but um inevitably we end up putting it back and even maybe sometimes i've seen it put back mid-year because of problems that um you know w around supervision so um, i'm leaning with uh with uh, chuck on this too i'm concerned <coughs> we're all concerned but this is what i just want to say i think it's a little it's too early for me i i understand my board members are weighing in and, and how important this is i, I just feel like I, I recognize that, but I, there are there are many other things too. Someone asked a question via an email about some of the lists and how are they prioritized? And they're not, not no list that I have seen is. You're gonna you're gonna get a prioritized list. Yeah. We we have prioritized. Okay. So I I just I just think I you know I need we've got a little bit more process to go here. And while this is an untenable you know cut and place to be in, I think we. We have to just still keep, I want to still be open to 
what the other what the options are because um, it, it, we have to really get as creative as we possibly can. So. Dr. Doxa? I'm. Um, what is going through my mind right now is that for me to make a decision on this, I will really need to hear from those people in the schools about how they will be able to compensate without these staff. I know that we're weighing priorities, um, and it's very difficult to make these cuts, and no one's happy about them. Um, but what will be important for me is to hear how these holes are going to be filled, how the students are still going to have the supports. And I'm assuming that if we have to lose these positions, that there would be a plan in place. Um, Dr. And Darby. I also want Th to Those are the conversations we're having right now with principals, and yeah. we will be communicating back to the committee what it's going to look like. Again, it's, it's not... This is not a desirable reduction. I, I need to make that very clear. Um, and but you know we we had we had to weigh when you're cutting eight hundred fifty thousand dollars. You you know you don't have a lot of options in front of you. <coughs> Chris. Oh, Dr. Doxer. I just I just wanted to say that um, I'm hearing how difficult this process was. And before we get to the end, I just want to say how much I appreciate the care and attention that's been put into creating this budget by you, but also by the people that you've consulted, bringing in the experts on the areas to, give their fee to gather their feedback on what is tolerable cuts and what can happen. So I just want to, when the questions are asked, they're asked in, in the process, not as a judgment, but as seeking out what our options are for this long-term process. I mean, essentially, oh, I'm it's not here. <laughs> Sorry. This is the impact. Yeah. This is what it's going to look like. You know, and we'll we'll drill down a little bit deeper for details, <laughs> but that's what it's going to look like. Martha, thank you. Sure. Um, so the impact of the substitute reduction. Uh, right now, we are uh, recommending reducing the budget by $137,000. Um, that came out of two different places. We, we have multiple substitute lines within our budget. Um, it came out of uh, the school-specific budgets, which is where they, um, they have for, you know, not long-term illness, but, but illness, um, uh, bereavement, uh, personal days, um, professional development. So it's a, a good chunk of this, the 93,000, was taken from the school-specific budgets. And some of that we are going to be looking at our, our practices and, and what we can do to help <coughs> offset that. And then we also took a, a $43,000 reduction to our long-term illness subline, which is where we cover maternity leaves, um, uh, where we also cover, uh, for instance, this year we've had uh, a number of teachers who have been out due to long-term illnesses, and that's where that gets moved from. So as I mentioned, we are going to change our practices with regard to how we use substitutes for professional development. Day. The addition of the two coaching positions will really change what professional development looks like in the district mm -hmm. going forward. Um, we're also going to do a fill rate analysis because one of the things that we did last year was we, um, we set higher daily rates for our um, short-term subs and our long-term subs. And one of the reasons we felt we had to advocate for that was we were having some fill rate issues. So we were have posting positions on ASAP, ASAP and they were going unfilled. So we're going to do a fill rate analysis just to see if that, um, that bump in pay to our daily rate and our long-term rates has had the impact that we want it to have. Because um, some of what that can tell us, if, if we're still having the same fill rate issues, then we didn't necessarily need to increase the rate to potentially um, mm -hmm. get the subs. So we might look at that, um, and then we're going to do an analysis of subs by category, and that means bereavement, um, personal days, family illness versus personal illness. Um, and so we're going to do a lot of analysis to make sure that that 137 is, um, is achievable, which we believe it is. Any questions? Okay. So um, Dr. Doherty spoke a little bit earlier about the impact of um, of the current space constraints that we have, um, what the potential impact could be on our budget or on our revolving fund, if you will. So right now, based on the um, based on the current data that we have for where um, where parents in the district have identified um, and what their neighborhood school is, we believe um, 
Dr. Doherty did a thorough analysis. He reviewed uh, each school, trying to figure out where we could have full day classes, where we would need to cut um, or, or not offer full day kindergarten to everyone. So our best analysis, best guess right now is that 80 students potentially would be impacted, so we would not be able to provide full day K. So right now, I think we have 227 students that have come forward. Next year, yes. Yeah, that I've identified. So of that 227, potentially 80 would not be able to get full day kindergarten as they, uh, as they want. Applying that 80 to the $4,200 tuition, um, the estimated revenue impact to our revolving fund is $336,000. The expense side of that means if we're not going to have full day kindergarten for those 80, then we would be reducing our budget by two full time teachers, by two full time paraeducators. So the offset to that 336 is 133,000. So this net impact of 202,000, <coughs> if we don't cut that from our budget, then that would be another 202,000 that would come out of our revolving fund. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Quick back. Well, just sure. thinking back to the last slide. Sorry, um, slow thinking here. Um, yeah. Okay. So, do we have a rough idea as to where we are this year in terms of, you know, what we budgeted and, and how we are expending it? Is I'm currently doing the forecast as okay, of December 31st for the committee, so, so I'll we'll have that later. Back on that later thank on you. Month. I should have known that. That's okay. <laughs> um, so restructured budget areas, um, I don't know if, if, uh, if Craig wants to talk a little bit about the coaches at this point. No, we got a slide on coaches. Oh, we got a slide. Okay. Um, so I we... Did I take over from this point? No. Um, I think no. you might have. Yeah. Yeah, this is Okay. <laughs> so in addition to the reductions, it's, it's you saw, we do have several positions in regular day that we're um, proposing to, re to restructure funding so that we can continue to um, <coughs> move forward in some critical areas. Um, in regular day, there are four areas. One is, which I, I think we've talked about several times, the grade one teacher, Joshua Eaton. Um, what we would do is we would take the funding for the, path, the class size for educators that we added this year for that kindergarten group and restructure it for the grade one teacher. I, I do want to add, going back to the previous slide, that if we do not get the modulars, we will not be adding a grade one teacher at Joshua Eaton, and the class size paraeducators would remain in the grade one classrooms um, for an, another year, because we wouldn't be able to add a classroom. Um, the, uh, the two coaches, the K-8, and Craig's gonna talk about the, the, uh, the importance of the two coaching positions. Um, we, are, we are taking this completely out of professional development funding, um, because they are going to be a very, uh, major part of the professional development provider in the in the district and then the technology replenishment if, if you recall prior to this year um, we had a hundred thousand uh, dollars in the technology replenishment um, line item um, to try to get us close to a five-year replenishment cycle um, this past year past year we had to cut two hundred eighty five thousand dollars from the budget fifty thousand of that was for technology um, so we are we are going to take per pupil building budget funding. Um, you remember you saw a twenty six thousand dollar cut, a twenty four thousand dollar cut um, in the previous in the reductions um, in restructuring it so that we can get that number back up to one hundred thousand um, dollars. So those are the restructured budget areas for regular day. I just want to continue to emphasize these are not additions to the FY sixteen budget. <coughs> these are restructured budget line items. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the instructional approach piece. I can just yeah, you can do it from yeah. here, from this one slide. Um, I really wanted an opportunity to talk just a little bit about these two positions because I think they're sort of key components um, to what really has been a, a district-wide theme that we've set for ourselves this year, and that is how to really um, improve our effectiveness and increase our capacity without necessarily increasing our financial needs of the district. Um, and I bulleted some notes here to myself I wanted to be sure and mention. Um, I mean, at this time when so much is happening in education, <coughs> I think they also, these positions represent a new way that we can support our teachers at this time. 
Um, Dr. Doherty mentioned things like the MTSS as well. These positions are going to help us with our core instructional strategies and inter interventions that are being developed. I mean, overall, as it says here on the slide, I think these positions will allow us to incorporate a much more on-the-job embedded approach to continuous professional development that not only enhances any PD that teachers receive, but also provides a much more effective way of applying that learning, both in the actual classrooms themselves with students, but also consistently across all classrooms and all levels. Um, I mean, that's why it's appropriate, because of the impact that it's going to have on professional development, that it's the PD funds that we're restructuring to make these positions um, possible. And frankly, it's something that we know teachers have been expressing the need for um, over the last year or so. Honestly, as we've examined in the last year, our capacity uh, that we need to develop in order to effectively sort of accomplish what we need to with the state's new frameworks, um, and to be honest, also to effectively address the level three issue, um, and some of those challenges that have been brought to light by that accountability, I think these coaching positions are really going to be essential to kind of continue that and sustain that process as we move forward. Um, in my discussions, not <coughs> only with teachers, but also with parents, um, these have, there have been suggestions about these positions that have been made because we know that other districts have positions like this and have been benefiting greatly from them. Um, they'll work together with some things that we've already put together in place. Um, this year, we have curriculum, teacher curriculum leaders that have been established, regular PLC, professional learning meetings that occur regularly, regularly now by grade level in every content area. Uh, we've already begun to implement these, um, and that's really a major structural change um, for our district that's having positive effects in how teachers collaborate, the common assessments that are being developed across the district, and the student results that teachers are examining. And these coaching positions will really allow us to sort of bring this to the next level uh, to make sure that we're able to continue this as we move forward. The positions themselves, while I think they will be involved in curriculum development, some vertical transition and assessment, first and foremost, their role will be as coaches, working closely with teachers. The vision really is for the math, literacy, and our, techno our existing technology integration specialists to work closely also together themselves um, so that that natural overlap that appears there has an impact in all content areas um, that's also, by the way, why another position, which I think is in a, probably another evening, it's, another, it's another, another area of the budget, the technician position is also important because it's going to allow our existing um, technology integration specialists to truly be more of an instructional specialist and coach and work with these math and literacy so that not so much time is spent rolling out devices or, or dealing with them. Um, hardware issues, which is important work, but a technician can do that work. This will allow them to work closely together. Um, I mean, so in short, I think that these are positions that are essential in helping us move forward. That's going to give us an increased capacity. Um, and so we were thrilled that we were able to restructure it to put these in place. Mrs. Brownski? I have a question about the instructional coaching positions. Um, it's, <coughs> it's a little bit more practical. So take the math one, you take literacy or math, pick one. But they're gonna have responsibility for K through eight. So they're going to be coaching um, teachers across seven schools and over 100 teachers. So how will you determine, it would seem to be that in one school year that coach is not, yeah. right. <laughs> like they can't be in the kindergarten, first, second, third, all the way up to eighth grade on a regular basis. Right. So yeah. how will you determine where to target them? Yeah, yeah, or will we, you? I, I'm having a little hard time seeing how the impact will be brought across the district. Right, right. And we actually had some discussion with our district leadership team about, you know, the best levels or what to make that position. Um, ultimately, we felt that a K-8, and we wanted a vertical, you know, connection and alignment, but clearly from year to year, um, while there's some leadership that can be provided vertically, K-8, to eight, um, year to year we're going to have to select some priorities. Um, right now, I think that the, for the next couple of, couple of years, the priority will be at the elementary level, or perhaps into sixth grade, 
which is the, the our new math and focus program is K through six. Um, that doesn't mean though that they're not able to work with our curriculum leaders and you know that um, help with seventh and eighth grade and they can be a part of some of those discussions. Their primary coaching role, I think, especially for the first couple of years, will be at the elementary level, to sixth grade. Yeah, that may change a few years from now. But yeah. Uh, I just wanted <coughs> to say that I thought this, I was really excited when I saw this because I think that, and it, I felt it was really appropriate to use the professional development funds for this because instead of teachers having to go outside the district, <coughs> learn something, and then be alone when they try to implement it in the classroom, this feeds into the idea of the professional learning communities where each of the teachers can be sharing and then they have someone that will support them in trying something new and support their students if there's a need, if there's a gap, um, then an instructional specialist will be well versed in what's going on in a classroom. So I just thought that this was a really good use of professional development funds and of sharing because if the professional, if the coaches learn something also, they can come in and work Absolutely. across the professional learning communities. So, thank you. Mr. Knight? I too, I think it's a great idea and it's long overdue, but the other thing too I think that's key um, is when you have, um, you know, down the road maybe new third grade teacher, new fourth grade teacher, and they don't know the math and focus curriculum, now you have somebody there that can actually go in the classroom yeah. Help them do it, as opposed to learning it in a you know isolation. So I think it's a great idea. I hope we continue to fund this. These sometimes become positions that when we get in tough, tough budget cycles, where they go, well, we'll just eliminate the. I've seen it happen other places, but I think it's critical. So nice job. Yeah. Um, thanks, Sharon. So yeah, that we we did that. When my oldest boys now third year in college were in fifth grade. So we had some of these positions. So hopefully we can hold on to them more consistently. Um, I, I have a question though about the um, professional development. Um, just, and I think this is just an overall mm -hmm. process because um, in the uh, figure 80, it, there's a, a $240,000 line there, which is a 40% reduction. Um, but then it basically says that our professional zone is really down to like sort of less than $50,000 um, when you look at, <coughs> when you sort of take out stipends, mentors, so. Yeah. That's all in that line, I think. Yeah. Okay, so that's tuition all in that two. Tuition reimbursement is a significant portion I mean, of that line. There's about, there's less than $50,000 next year for PD. For, so for if a, a teacher um, is, let's say, we, we've just talked about that this, this rule, these rules will focus, let's say, K to six. So you have a seventh through twelfth grade teacher that wants to do some something that's a, more of a class, an external type of thing. And that's what that 50000 is? Well, if they want to take a class, that's that would oh, probably fall under tuition reimbursement. That, so that is in that line item, but that that's a, that'd be a separate. But I guess some, Tuition well, reimbursements in professional development. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay. That's why the number is over 200000 But there's only about $50,000. That is the PD funding piece that and we so would what, use to what would that be like if it's not, if it's not a, a class? If that's a, like, like to like a, a workshop. workshop or a conference. Yeah. 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 Okay, or some curriculum development time during the summer. That would come out of that line. Okay. Okay, so I just wanted to make sure that I was understanding. And then in Table 81, the professional development line items are sort of more detailed out, and then they go back in, sort of. It's hard to make sense of that. So, right, yeah, pro professional development is broken out by what category it ends up in. Mm -hmm. So, yes. Most most of it, yeah, most of it is in um, other expenses, which is where we have our tuition reimbursement and things like that at the district level. Okay, I just wanted to make sure that I understood that. That I think what what most people think of as the actual professional development is really the fifty thousand dollar number. Correct. Correct. Um, That's why we put that in the narrative. Mm -hmm. right. right. Mr. Robinson, instructional coach's question. Yes, uh, Craig. Uh, so this through the restructuring, it's two positions. I think that. So, can you 
kind of why you mentioned take two years probably will will be go toward K through eight K through or no, elementary I'm sorry K five K5. K5. so you know we have five elementary schools two positions can you kind of walk through how that I mean I think you mentioned Joshua Eaton <coughs> that's probably where it's going to start uh, yeah. and walk through how it's going to work because that's a lot of a lot of teachers that, that need coaching uh, through five schools. But I also think a key part is, as I mentioned, that some of the other structures that we put in place, <coughs> that the teachers also now are regularly working together in their grade level content area PLCs, that we've identified some teacher leaders who facilitate that work, so that will also be happening at the same time. So even, for instance, with the five elementary schools and five days a week, I mean, we haven't figured out a specific schedule yet, but even if they're spending a day in each school in actual classrooms, that's a significant amount of time that they can be working. Um, and, and yes, and Joshua Eaton, but, but one of the things that we've identified that really has happened with Joshua Eaton is that our teachers, especially at a time with such transition happening and going to a new program, needing that opportunity to connect, to look at the progress that students are making, not just in their own classroom or even in their own building, but across the district. And so this type of position allows that type of consistency. Um, even with the common assessment data that we're or common assessments that we're putting in, pla in place so that that data you know, t um, is able to yield information to us in a way that we're not waiting for a state assessment to tell us, but we're able to see you know, um, how kids are responding to different approaches across the district. So I, I, mean, I think it's very true. It's a model, too, that we've uh, reached out to some other districts and looked at what they've had in place. And um, this is a model that I think some people have used very effectively. So we're going to move on to special education now. Dr. Jerry, were there any questions from the audience regarding regular day, anything? Great. Thank you, Dr. Okay, it's going to you. Oh, Mrs. Copeland. Coaches. Throw one money. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the new contract, it was 950 with up to three courses. Correct. So that, that money is still in there. Well, don't forget, there's a cap. Right. So it's with the cap. The cap is what's right. budgeted. But not only is teacher tuition reimbursement in that professional development plan, but we have paraeducator, professional development, and secretary. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, tuition reimbursement, secretary, tuition reimbursement. That's all in that same line. And that total has not been reduced for next no. year. No. no. no all contractual just obligations. Yeah. All contractual obligations are built into this budget. <clears throat> just, just wanted to make Refreshing. sure that the, the top number, you know, mm -hmm. the total. Thank, Thank you very much. So um, Carolyn and Martha will be doing most of the talking in this presentation, but I'll give you an introduction. So the major cost center functions for special education, um, you have a function called curriculum directors, which includes your director of student services, the clerical support that goes with that, any special education tutoring services, software licenses, um, supplies and materials. Um, you also have a function called school curriculum leads, which is the RISE preschool director, the clerical support that goes with that, and the high school special education department chair. Um, and then you have the instructional coordinator function, which are our team chair for your persons. Under the instructional teaching services piece, again, this is related to students' IEPs, individualized education plans. You have all of your learning center and program teachers. Uh, in your therapist, speech and language, occupational therapist, physical therapist, nursing staff that are connected to a student with an IEP. This is not other nurses that's connected to the health services um, cost center. Um, special education paraprofessionals, um, students that require extended year programming, the, um, the budget for that is in this function. Uh, any consultational services, which would include uh, EMARC, would be in this function. Uh, any contracted therapeutic services, substitute teachers for um, special education staff, and any PD for special education staff. You also have all instructional materials and equipment that are related to a student's IEP, um, adaptive equipment, general supplies, things like that. Um, any testing and assessment for students that are on IEPs or could be eligible to be on uh, IEPs would fall under this category. 
and psychological services that are different from our um, school psychologists. Um, even though our school psychologists do, do a lot of testing, um, they do not fall under this cost center. So we do have a district administrator of support services, um, district-wide evaluator who does the initial testing for our elementary schools, um, and then we have two social workers that are connected to students in programs, um, a middle school social worker and a high school program social worker. The high school program social worker is for the TSP and the middle school is for the SSP. And then sometimes we have to contract out for psychological evaluations, um, and so that would fall under here, and then any supplies and materials for that testing. So your protocols, things like that. Then you also have um, some bigger function areas, your transportation services for out of district and in district. Um, our collaborative use, <coughs> Medicaid claiming services, remember we do um, have uh, some funding that we can claim federal funding for Medicaid, um, and remember that that funding goes into the general fund in the town. In the, in the town. Um, we do not get that, but we do provide the services in district to make that happen. Um, and then the tuition, which is a very large portion of, of the cost center, your public collaboratives, your private residential, and your private day. And then legal services, um, which aren't just special ed related. We use our legal services to review our handbooks. Um, uh, today I asked a question um, related to a Title IX issue to our legal services. So. Um, uh, this is legal services for all student services, not just special education. So again, the connection to our, our goals, you can see here that there are several areas, again in the bold, um, where we are connected. Uh, the budget for this cost center connects to our, to our goals. Um, so you can see also this several areas here. So the, the cost center drivers, uh, again, salary increases, contractual salary increases, um, an increase in out-of-district tuitions that we, we are known. Um, we are budgeting approximately a 3% increase for any public, private um, out-of-district uh, tuitions and any anticipated out-of-district um, placements. Um, and also we, we have a contractual increase in special education transportation that we are building in. What is not in this budget, and I want to emphasize, are any unanticipated special education uh, placements that we are not aware of, uh, which would also mean transportation included in that. And we do not have any additional paraeducators built in to this budget um, as well. Uh, in terms of decreases, you remember we talked about in the original presentation, there is a circuit breaker decrease uh, because we do have less students that qualified um, for this year, for next year's um, funding. And we are uh, decreasing, or re restructuring the EMOC services, which is uh, resulting in a decrease. We have uh, increased two offsets. Um, one is the tuition revolving account for students that we are tuitioned in from other districts, and the rise revolving account um, because of the increase in rise population. The, um, these are really to offset the circuit breaker decrease. How much was the decrease? Uh, so I'm going to turn this over to Carolyn now, and she's going to talk about um, the different services and some of the other pieces of the budget. So this is a list of the programs that we have. I think when I originally presented to you, we talked about the different programs we have um, across the district. And these programs can provide a continuum of service. So our goal in Reading is to provide from the least restrictive to the most restrictive. So our developmental learning center is for students identified on the autism spectrum, and that's located at Barrows, Birch Meadow, Coolidge, and at the high school with the goal of fully transitioning from Barrows to Birch Meadow. Um, the Integrated Learning Program, or the INLP, is for students identified with cognitive deficits, and that's located at Wood End, Coolidge, and Apple High School. We have the Language Learning Differences Program, or the LLD Program, for students identified with language-based learning disabilities. That's located at Eaton, Parker, and Apple High School. We have learning centers located at all of our programs. We have our student support program for students with social and emotional impairments at Killam, Coolidge, and Apple High School. 
and our therapeutic support program is located at the high school. It's a more restrictive program for students with um, social emotional impairments. And finally, um, this year we have a program called Compass, which is located at Coolidge, and it's for students identified with multiple disabilities who really require substantially separate programming that focuses on academics, life skills, and social skills. So this gives you a sense of our enrollment data. I will say this is a snapshot because if you work in special education, what you know is that <coughs> these numbers never stay stable. And every day we have team meetings which impact um, our numbers. So this is kind of a snapshot of where students fell, I think, probably about a month ago. <laughs> so this could look very different this week. Yeah. Not super different, but you know, things change. Students are identified or referred for programs. So this gives you a sense of how they break out in the different programs. And then this, I think we've seen a couple of times this um, slide about some of the enrollment trends that we have. Looking at during the 14-15 school year, we have 809 students identified um, for receiving um, special education services, which is about 17.3% of our total student population. And we have 61 current students in out of district groups. Mrs. Webb? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So can you just clarify for me, is the 197 students who are in the specific programs also on the IEP and in the 809 or not? Yes. 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 Okay. They would be included in this number. So those students that you're seeing in the program list yeah. are students who are enrolled in programs versus the learning center. Mr. Sorry, Mr. Ryan, I'm just curious if you know, I'm not sure. You, you might know since you work with Betsy. Um, how does that compare percentage of students um, that are enrolled in special education? How does that compare to other communities? So you'll see in that column there, it says percentage of students statewide. Oh. So there's an average there of 17.1, and we're at about 17.3. Okay. So. Mr. Robinson? Can, can you mind flipping back to that? Sure. So, the, yeah, the Compass program, I guess that wasn't missed that one. Yeah. This, is a, this is a new program this year. And it's at, just that cool. And so what will we do now? We have one student in, in the, what, what pro, will they go and do a program at the high school next year? That's our hope. We've been doing a lot of work. Some of the work we've been doing during the PLC time has been vertical alignment with these programs, so bringing them together to discuss that. And there are conversations about how we're going to move that program forward to the high school and support that. Student. So, so they wouldn't necessarily fit into one of the 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 I guess would be the SSP or the TSP. Uh, there may be a probably more of our ILP. Okay. Would have ILP two, our more intensive population of students. Okay. So. Thank so you. Sure, Mrs. Bell. Were you just saying that it might not? You're, you're still looking at that, so it might um, require. Well, no. Our goal with this student would be to transition. Oh, into the probably the ILP two. Oh, okay. That's really the idea. And then um, our students that are currently serviced by EMARC, that are those are students that are beyond. That, that, are they up there on, on the on the board? Are they? No. We can talk a little bit more about that. Those students um, are students who are in both our integrated learning program and also some students who are in our learning center as well as in our SSP program. I don't think they're limited to just one program. Um, and I can talk a little bit more about what we envision for that. Questions on this slide? Thank you. All right. So I'm going to skip through this piece. Um, we talked about this. So um, in special education, we're looking to restructure um, funding to better support students in two areas. Um, we are looking at um, restructuring to create a program director for our student support program and therapeutic support program that would be a vertical position that would be district wide. And then we are also looking to add a board certified behavior analyst. Again, that would be a district wide position. And really, the goals of these positions for both of them are really looking at improving student outcomes in our programs, looking at supporting our staff, similar to the coaching piece that Mr. Martin spoke about, and also working with our families. So, the program director for TSP SSP, this is a restructuring of an existing position. The position that we have is one that's utilized to support our middle school and high school students who are re-entering from hospitalization 
and to do some social emotional um, evaluations of those students at the middle school high school position and we felt that this would be a good match to what we are looking for in this position so TSP and SSP service our students identified with social emotional and behavioral challenges and we want to make sure that we have a strong program that is consistent from Killam all the way up to the high school we want to identify clear research-based interventions and by having a program director who can oversee this, we can work to identify interventions that can be successful for these students. We want to um, make sure that what we're doing at Killam is going to carry over to Coolidge, is going to carry over to the high school. We also want to make sure we have regular meetings that are um, kind of team meetings because we need to support those students, <coughs> but we also need to support the staff in those programs. We've seen a high number of staff turnover in both our TSP and SSP programs, and those staff need support from someone on a regular basis to help them manage these students. I also see this person as being a resource for some of our Tier 3 supports for MTSS, looking at social emotional, idea, um, social emotional supports and being a resource to um, our teachers in coaching. I see them assisting in development of parent outreach and support programming. We've talked already with some of the SSP staff about doing more parent outreach, about doing more workshops for families um, so that they can feel supported and we can carry over some of the work that we're doing in school into the home for families. Um, and these students also, also have a lot of wraparound services and we need someone to assist with the coordination of care. Thank you. Mr. Robinson. So I think we added the SSP and t maybe TSP around the same time, like two or three years ago? TSP. TSP. Yep. Uh, and you said we're having trouble. Uh, <coughs> is, are yep. we, do a lot of districts have that program or how are we losing those? I mean, I thought we were innovative in doing that, uh, having that, pro at putting that program in our district. Well, it is an innovative program. Um, it's it's a combination of finding the the right staff, the right staff to do it, and 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 it, it, it's it's a demanding job. Yeah. I mean, you're dealing with our mo the the most emotionally fragile kids. They're the kids that are getting hospitalized. I understand. So, but why are we losing people because of? Income or or no, no it's no, not. No, it's I not think it's the income. Environment. No. It's making sure we have those um, layers in, in place to support our staff. So one of the things you'll find in a, a more intensive, like a collaborative program or a private day program, is you find that you have these kind of middle management, for no other you know, term, but that is a support to the staff who are doing the work day in and day out. Our staff can be a resource, and we have tried some different models of using. Um, some consultants, but we really feel like we need someone in-house who can provide that regular support for our teaching staff so that the, the quality of the work they're doing with students is going to improve. Because, I mean, I'm, my sense is that's devastating to a student when they lose right, I agree. someone yeah. that they're close to. I agree. We need to keep those people. Mr. Knight? So, <clears throat> my question would be <coughs> the current position that we're going to uh, essentially eliminate the, the, it's, it would seem to me that the services that he provided as you described are critical and is, is there going to be someone picking up the pieces for that I mean those those are direct yeah. services with students that are you know talk about um, you know coming in with a you know from hospitalizations mm -hmm. and it's just critical that you need to have someone there to help support them so the analysis that we did is the majority of the students who are coming in and out of hospitalization are our students in these programs. Um, so this person here as the program director would be assisting with that reentry process. We have also added a regular ed um, social worker at the high school who is assisting with students who are not identified and she's been doing a lot of that support for our high school population around that. So, so this position would essentially fulfill would the responsibilities. Those are the yeah. And at the middle school level, we have a middle school social worker that's connected to the middle school level of this program, and that person would be assuming. <coughs> that piece. Thank you. So um, did you say that at the high school level we have a social worker that helps? General. 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 
helps to address kids that may not be may not be identified in this um, TSP program. That that kind of position was put in the show. Okay, but they but I guess the idea there is if you have that resource, you can get them back on track and support yes. them, and then they're not going to yes, they're not going to end up. Yeah. Okay, and I guess I just wanted to say so in terms of you know, the development of the parent outreach and support program, I was you know, thinking about community resources that might be able to partner with, certainly like uh, understanding disabilities and um, obviously the PAC and things, right? So hopefully we can leverage some of those resources. Yeah. Um, so in a perfect world, though, it seems like this position, it's, it seems like it's well needed uh, and to see the vertical alignment and the, and the significance of that. But you know, would you want to keep, in a perfect world, if you know, money was no object, would you keep a person in that role that we currently have? Uh, would that be something that just seems like it's, you know, duplicating services? Or? I think there would be a lot of duplication. Um, and, I, and I think for <coughs> what this can provide, the, the benefits are, are greater to make this restructuring. And the district-wide benefits. I think that the yeah, the district-wide benefits. Because, yeah, no you know, we, we have programs at all three levels, and we don't have that coordination right now, and so that's why the, we yeah, really I, need... I think, you know, I agree with that. I think the vertical alignment's critical. I just think <coughs> that those high school students that are coming back from hospitalizations, I just would want to make sure that they're going to be able to it just seems like a, a, a big job description is all I'm saying. <coughs> Concern that those students will be, you know, short, short changed to some degree, hopefully not, but I'm, I'm, wor I'm worried about that. Well, I think the other piece to remember is both TSP and SSP at the high school also have a social worker attached to each of those programs. So there is counseling support already attached. Are those TSP, has, uh, TSP has its own social, social worker. SSP has its own social worker. So those programs are staffed by both a special educator and a social worker. And then this position would be the coordination of the so I don't know if that helps kind of frame a little more. Um, I was just curious, in a hospital environment, do we often find there's someone in the hospital who can help support our programs so they dovetail in such a way that the transition is smoother? Mm -hmm. I don't know if the hospital often has any resources. We use, um, we do have a hospital reentry process that was created kind of before my tenure, so I can't take credit for it, but we really work with the hospitals and they do a nice job in kind of not just having students come back and say, hey, here you go, we're back in school. We really work to create a transition plan that includes all players. Um, so that's done both elementary, middle, and high school. We really are mindful in our process, and I think the hospitals are pretty open to that, depending on where the students are placed. So. Thank you. Okay. <coughs> Moving on to the board certified behavior analyst. So this position, the BCBA, um, currently we use um, our consulting funds. We work with Student Collaborative. And every time we need this type of service, we contract with them to provide a service provider. Um, the, some of the struggles we've had that I've heard from both staff and families is that um, sometimes we have delays in the ability to provide the service um, due to availability from SEAM. Um, sometimes we have different service providers, so one person may have come out to do the evaluation, and then we need that person to, we need someone to provide consult to that student on a regular basis. Well, the same person isn't available, so now we have a new person who's starting up. Um, we don't have control over who that person is because they're a contracted service provider. So this position would be a restructuring of the, the, the funds that we're already spending on consulting, and it would expand all of our district-wide programs in helping to boost those programs. Um, they would help us for any student who has a behavioral need completing functional behavioral assessments that, again, we currently contract out. Um, it will allow us to have more consistent access to those behavioral supports, to develop behavior intervention plans, collect data. Um, one of our big focuses in special education is on how we collect data, how we analyze data in effective ways. So having a BCBA on staff who can model that would help all of our staff to grow. Um, we have some students who receive home programming. This would allow us to have some oversight over that with our own staff. Um, and it would also help with our MTSS process and allow us, again, to identify supports 
that could be available for any student through the use of the BCBA. I have reached out to area communities about how they've created this position in-house. Um, most of our neighboring communities do have at least one BCBA on their staff. Some of them still use um, consulting services, but much less than we do. And um, we would really be looking to create some consistent criteria on who would access <coughs> um, this service, why they would access it, and what type of resources would be available. But it is a position, I think, that will booster boost the services and increase um, our ability to work with some really challenging students um, and really improve the consistency. I also see this person being able to do um, some of the home consult um, and be able to work with families as well. And some staff training that we really need in this area. Mm -hmm. Mr. Robinson, uh, I think this is good. Uh, I guess I'm just trying to think uh, in terms of now we're getting this service from SEAM now. Mm -hmm. Is is there any leverage we can use with them to tell them that we're considering doing this? Uh, and and maybe still get it there, but get somebody that's uh, dedicated to renting <coughs> as opposed to, you know, whoever answers the phone. Uh, just trying to yeah. think of ways. No, it's a, it's a good question. Um, I mean, SEAM, SEAM has uh, BCBAs on staff. Yeah. Um, so they're, they have the same bills they have to pay as, as we do. So, you know, they're, they're not going to probably give, they, we already get a discounted rate because we belong to the SEAM collaborative. So I don't think they're going to give us anything less because they would have to give all their members the same rate. But it sounds like, uh, you said some of the other communities are already going this way or have gone this way. So right. I would think rather than them having to cut staff because they don't have a, communities don't have a need for that service anymore, they may be just something to think. Yeah, no, they, no, it's a good point. I'll, I'll be honest, I don't think it's a service that they're going to see a decrease. <laughs> 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 I, I just have to be honest and sort of the needs students that sure. are presenting in districts and, this, and the type of programs that we're creating in districts call for us to have these type of supports that we probably would not have these students in district before. Mm -hmm. so. What are we budgeting this position at? 60000 60000 mm -hmm. Is that realistic though? That's, uh, does it um, seem like, seems like short money for a position like that? It's, it's the equivalent of what, what it, we're paying to seem right now. So our fallback is if we can't find some of that, we can continue to contract with seem. Right. So. Mrs. Webb? Yeah, that was sort of my line of questioning. Was okay. it looks like that <coughs> taller, and did you, would you think that you would be able to really find someone for what we can we're hoping? Okay. <laughs> um, we're reaching out to, to um, Endicott, because they have a program mm -hmm. at Endicott, and I've reached out to the director of the program to see if they have any graduates. Mm -hmm. Who are hungry. Yeah. Hungry. hungry for experience. Yeah. Yeah. But we want someone who has some experience and um, you know, job that needs it. Yeah. Yeah, we Thank don't you. want to turn it into a training <coughs> ground no. for but we're happy to take interns. We can well, they both play. Most of those graduates Great. those and the cost of graduates don't have yeah. experience. Yeah. So that's a postgraduate uh, degree, though. Right. Yeah. So you're going to a master's degree plus, too, yeah, right? Yeah, they're a master's degree plus. Yeah. For this. Yeah. Thank you. All right. <coughs> All right, now I'm going to turn it over to Jennifer. She did a good job. I agree. Oh. She played with me. Expect. Yeah. Staffing. Right. I mentioned earlier tonight that this is a massive spreadsheet that gets pivoted one way and many, many different ways. But um, this was where uh, it's nice to know that people actually do read the budget book because I was uh, I had some outreach from our OTs because they noticed that the 2.9 was going to 2.4 and they wanted to know what was happening. And this is where at the beginning of the year um, we had somebody who was on the and so their position didn't roll forward through the newest budget module <coughs> and manually went and added them back in. So their salary is in there, but 0.5 of their time is not. So this, is, this will be corrected in the next version of the budget, but I just want to point that out to you. The dollars were correct. The dollars are the dollars correct, are right. but the FTE uh, number is <coughs> Where am I? That's <laughs> yes. 
Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah. so uh, some of the highlights on this one, the, the 1.0 BCBA that, that uh, Mrs. Wilson just spoke about is there. Um, the 1.0 for the program director, you know, recall that this was a restructuring of a position that was in the regular day budget. Um, so those are a couple of things that I wanted to point out to you. Um, when it comes to expenses by cost center, um, one of the most telling things here that I, I really want to point out to you again, because we talked about a little bit in regular day, but this professional salary line is going up by 2.2%, but that's misleading because that is where we budgeted all of the additional offsets to, um, to help with the circuit breaker reduction this year. So, um, so this line is, is a little, it's, it's not understated because they're net of that number. The other one I wanted to point out to you was contractual services going from 1.49 million to 1.31. Um, uh, this is where the EMARC restructuring is. This is also where um, we've done a little bit of um, the consulting restructuring for BCBA. And it's also where um, we reduced our legal um, budget for this year. Right now, we're trending, I want to say, to about $60,000 for this year. So um, so we were maybe a little bit aggressive on that, and that, that's what we used as our budget number for next year. Mr. Robinson. John, a few minutes ago, you said all of our legal. No, no, all of our no, no, special no, no. ed. Anything that deals with student services, right. so not, not labor. labor. <laughs> not labor. Oh, no, no, that's in the uh, administration. Right. No, I figured yes. that. But yeah. Yeah. No, good, good point to make some good distinction there. No. All right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, I just got back to page one here. Could you please just repeat the, what you said about the professional salaries? Oh, sure. Okay. So professional salaries, if you recall, when we budget our offsets from our revolving funds, we budget them as a reduction to professional salaries. So the increases that we took to our revolving funds from our special education revolving fund and from our RISE revolving fund, both of those are baked into that $4,751,000 number. So if those offsets weren't there, it would be <coughs> incrementally higher. So I just, because if you look at professional salaries, it's only going up by 2.2%. So right. it's a little bit deflated because of what we do budgetarily with the offsets. You're welcome. Um, talked about contractual services. Um, if you look at supplies, uh, it, it looks like it's going down by a significant percentage. But the fifty thousand dollars is, you know, it's a little bit consistent with what we spent two or three years ago. Um, so when Carolyn and I were looking at the budget and where we could really kind of tighten the belt for next year, this was one of the lines. Um, and uh, yeah. this is just another. Oh, should I? So oh, back to contractual services. This might be a question for Carol. So. Um, the, the EMAC reduction. Yes. Mm -hmm. What can you tell me about um, how we're going to accommodate those students mm -hmm. going forward? Because I know it pertains specifically to those students that I think we heard from Dr. Dog that are over uh, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18 to job, mm -hmm. uh, school job. Uh, so one of the things we've been doing, so we do have a teacher that works in that program, we've been looking to identify more um, internship opportunities and actually just this evening I was made aware that um, they're going to be working over at Birch Meadow, which I'm very excited. So the students will have an opportunity <coughs> to do internships and some job coaching there in the library. So we're really looking at how to utilize our staff and what opportunities we can create here on this campus with the YMCA, with Coolidge, with Birch Meadow and those opportunities and looking at when do we use EMARC because we can do some things here um, that we've been using EMARC for. So there are things that are happening kind of that are a duplication and we're looking to eliminate the duplication. We, just just to be clear, we're not eliminating EMARC services. No. Um, we spend well over $200,000 a year on EMARC right now. Yes. So this is a, re a reduction of 30000 
Yeah. Right. Yes, and the duplication of like, you know, having um, our staff good. here while our program staff are here and, and what's happening during that time. So can we offer some <coughs> of that job coaching, that job shadowing on site to meet the mark to provide that? So that's the analysis we're doing. It's not a kind of blanket reduction. It's more looking at individual students and looking at how we're utilizing our time and what is that post-grad program look like that we're providing. So those, the EMAC, those, the staff that EMAC hires, the job coaches, are they, are they trained in, I mean, I'm sure they all have uh, uh, degrees, mm -hmm. but are they trained specifically in job coaching, or are they going to be along the same lines as the people that we have currently on staff? I, I would say they're similar, but I don't know exactly, yeah. so I could get you some more information on that. I'm meeting with them. All right, great, thanks. Yeah. I'd be interested in that hearing what you have, what you learn. Um, so this is a, a more detailed listing of the process by DBSC function code. Um, so again, I just want to point out, you know, that we did take a, a $20,000 reduction to the legal budget next year versus what was budgeted this year, but based on our terms of the issue, we think that that's, uh, that's, that's reasonable. Um, again, I wanted to point out some of the um, the teacher specialist line you see that is decreasing by 2.4 percent. That's not. That's not. <coughs> I want to say it's real, but that's where we budget the offset. So that that's why that's looking like that. Um, some of the uh, department heads. Some of this is just uh, swapping out who was on our IDEA grant. So again, no one's going away, but we're changing where we're charging some people next year. Um, uh, therapeutic services. BCBA, um, restructuring the uh, the BCBA and uh, and E Mark is in that one. Uh, the climate control plan. Uh, climate control. <laughs> yeah. The uh, school transformation. Climate control. Well, I said something earlier to Craig saying um, he has the new PowerPoint for tonight. <laughs> So, uh, so the school climate transformation grant, the, um, uh, this line here where we have the school psychological services, um, that's where we budgeted an offset of $45,000, um, and that's for the program uh, coordinator for the, that grant. Um, so that is the only budgeted offset uh, here. Where was that? Uh, it was in... Um, 280? <coughs> Tuition to other districts, um, all of our tuition accounts starting with 910 going through 940. Those were, um, Carol and I uh, put together a list back in, I want to say September, October, right at the beginning of the school year that we've been pretty uh, diligent about updating. Um, and so when we had to provide accommodated costs to the town manager, we felt like we had a very good, good visual on where our kids were and who was on the radar. So at that point in time, we these numbers in the FY16 budget really reflect uh, a thoughtful analysis of who who is already out of district and who may go. Um, and then in the 930 line, the tuition and state, that's where the uh, the circuit breaker gets budgeted. Um, and so as part of that million nine hundred nineteen thousand dollars, the nine hundred fifty-two thousand dollars that we're budgeting for the circuit breaker offset which is this year's award, which we're very fortunate that we're carrying forward so we have pledge of certainty next year, is there. And um, I know there were some questions about 9C cuts. Um, the proposed 9C cuts by the former governor uh, don't impact this part of Circuit Breaker. They were recommended for extraordinary relief, which we, we don't qualify for, given our population right now. So that was... Uh, Mrs. Webb. So, no. You may have... Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I've already talked about this. Sorry, if you did that. Um, so the that out of state <coughs> tuition uh, number. Can you give any background on that? I know that we have to be cautious about. Sure. So so currently there is one student who is currently placed, mm -hmm. and that's the number that you're seeing the <coughs> FY15 number, and the number that you're seeing um, if you look at the last two years trend. And for next year, there is a student that we feel is, is going to be placed, and we've made an estimate on where we think he's going to be placed based on the tuition for that facility. That's what's in there for next year. It's two students. Yes. Yeah, one student. 
two fair two, years. Two, well, one, <coughs> one that we're seeing sort of in previous years. Correct. An additional student that hasn't been in this district yes. before, or? No, he's been in this, pla in this type it's, of a place. It's, it's, it's going to be a placement. Mr. Knight? Um, no, I'm all, I'm all set. Great. Okay. Thank you. Okay. That was it. That's it. Questions? Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, very well prepared. Thank you both. That was excellent. Um, so we're meeting again uh, Thursday evening where we'll finish the uh, budget presentations. Same meeting time Thursday at 7. Uh, I believe that to finish this evening, we might have minutes that we need to approve. And then we can uh, move to approve the open session minutes dated December 22nd, 2014. Is there a second? Second. Great. All those in favor of the motion? Opposed? Uh, these weren't those the updated. Are, update. are these the updated ones? These are, these are not. I do not believe these are the updated ones. No. We're approving the updated ones? Yep. Yes. Oh. Okay. That's what I was saying. saying. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> these are the updated minutes. Yeah. We still want to do that? Let's do it one more time. All those in favor? <laughs> motion carries 6 0. Uh, we don't have executive session. We do not have executive session. Move to adjourn. Second? Second. All those in favor? And we're adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.